My name is Matthew Lodge. Uh, I'm from Weaveworks. We're a small startup uh, in the Docker space uh, based here in San Francisco and also out of uh, London. Uh, and I'm going to talk to you about deploying microservices on ECS and how you can do that uh, more quickly and easily. If you think about a uh, typical microservice, the, the pattern you see is some kind of client, somebody who wants to make use of this microservice. Let's say this was authentication for a website. So you've got a collection of containers, worker containers. Usually these are replicas of a single uh, image, single container image, and they implement the service. So you might pass in some credentials, username, password, um, and one of that, that request goes into some kind of uh, proxy or load balancer, gets given to one of these worker processes, one of these replicas, uh, does the authentication and passes back, you know, pass or fail, maybe some uh, other, you know, token that says something about permissions of that particular user, and that's a microservice. So when you uh, take this um, pattern, then it fits really well into the model of containers and, uh, and Docker. So you can see how you can map all of this stuff into containers. That looks pretty straightforward. But it actually turns out it's quite difficult to do this on Docker. And um, part of the challenge is just simply getting the request from one container to another. So one of the things that um, you know, this used to be the way Docker worked up until version 1.9, we had this port mapping. And you can see this in, um, in task definitions. You look in ECS. One of the things you're going to be setting up is these port mappings. So on the Docker host, the ECS instance, you have this external port and internal port. So the containers have a port number. So this client might, you know, something else might call the client on port 80. Um, and then you map that into an external port of 8080. And then you do the same thing on this other instance over here. So you have an external port that maps to an internal port. And as you can imagine, this is all quite tedious. It also presents you with a, a real challenge when you want to do something like develop your microservice or your application on your laptop and then you want to deploy to ECS, and now you're going to have to worry about managing two sets of configuration. Once the one thing that works on your laptop and then something else entirely for when this gets deployed uh, elsewhere. Docker introduced uh, Docker networking in version 1.9, where uh, you now have a virtual network for the containers. So just a container-only network. Um, it's an overlay. It actually runs over VXLAN uh, tunnels in between the hosts. So there is a, an Ethernet bridge on each host. All the containers are connected to the bridge. They just use their normal port numbers. And then between the hosts, there's VXLAN tunnels, right? So that traffic goes across you know, VPC or whatever it is on, uh, on ECS. So this is obviously uh, much simpler from an application standpoint. The challenge, though, is that when you deploy this on Docker, uh, you end up with a lot of configuration and a lot of extra things. So in Docker 1.9, you need this thing called a cluster store. Uh, the default cluster store in Docker networking is based on console. Uh, you can use etcd, you can use Zookeeper as well. But the purpose of the cluster store is to keep track of all the things on the network. So all the IP addresses for the containers, and then all the name mappings for uh, name resolution. So you, um, ironically, you can't run the cluster store in a container, because uh, it has to be up and running before the cluster starts. So when the cluster starts, and when you start containers, what happens is Docker goes off to the cluster store to allocate IP addresses to containers. And so that has to happen on this cluster store because you don't want to hand out duplicate addresses. So the way that's implemented in Docker 1.9 and, and Docker 1.10 is that you go to the cluster store and you ask it for um, a transaction, a consensus transaction, involving all of the members of that database. So in console, it's a, um, it's a consensus algorithm. So you, you have to have at least three nodes. You can't have to consensus with two nodes, because if they differ, then you don't know which one to choose. So with three nodes, uh, and then no more than five, uh, because that's the design maximum for a console. So the challenge here is that you've just introduced a whole bunch of care and feeding and extra stuff and extra configuration you now have to do on this cluster store. You also have to configure your Docker hosts so they know about the cluster store, they have the right credentials, all those other good things. And so what looked like something that was fairly simple has now actually turned out to be quite complicated to deploy. Um, and then in production, if you lose contact with anything, any of the cluster stores, um, then you can't start or stop any containers because they can't get IP addresses and they can't hand them back. So we set out to solve this uh, problem. But what we do is... Um, we have this uh, product called WeaveNet that makes things simpler. And essentially what we do is we just do away with that cluster store. And instead, we have routers that run on every Docker host. And they work a lot like the internet. 
uh, routers in the internet. So routers in the internet just talk to each other, they learn, they have some local configuration, uh, and they learn about the topology of the network from each other by exchanging uh, updates. Um, and in the case of the Weave routers, they also can hand out IP addresses. And I'll talk a little bit more about how that works in a second, but essentially what we do is we get rid of that cluster store, you get rid of all the configuration associated with that. And also for service discovery, now uh, we can uh, respond to DNS queries from containers in the cluster. And so if you want to, you, you know, your client container wants to find the worker, you can just do a DNS request for the name of the container and you get an IP address back. That's, and now you've done service discovery, you know where your containers are, regardless of where they're running. They could be running anywhere in the cluster. You can also use WeaveNet itself uh, and the micro DNS server for a basic form of load balancing, so DNS-based load balancing. So you've got multiple containers with the same name, so if these are all called worker, then we can round robin the IP addresses that we hand back from DNS, and therefore you can uh, use a basic form of load balancing uh, with WeaveNet. Let's take a look at uh, how we might do this. So I'm going to do a quick demo here. I'm going to run this locally on my machine, and then I'm going to run it on AWS ECS. So I'm just using Docker machine. So here I have a blank uh, Docker machine, and I'm going to start the Weave network. That gives you that SDN. And that's it. So I'm now running a software-defined network uh, on my uh, laptop in the, this particular virtual box uh, installation here. And if I was running this on multiple instances, I would just do Weave launch on each one of them. Um, and I just need to tell it about another Weave router. I'll get onto that in a second. So now every container that comes up is going to get its IP address, it's going to be on the SDN, and it's going to have that name resolution. So if I do Docker PS here, what I can see is the uh, Weaveworks router. Um, we have a, an API proxy for the Docker API, so we can see what's going on with uh, when a container starts. We can then hook into that and give it an IP address, for example. Uh, and then also uh, this functions as a plugin for Docker, for Docker networking, so you can see that running as well. So what I'm going to do is start a bunch of containers that implement uh, an app that's made up of a number of different microservices. So really what I'm doing here is uh, I'm just running Docker Run, essentially. I've got a script. So I just ran a bunch of uh, different applications in containers. I can see that I've got a bunch of different things in here. Some of it's in Python. I've got some Nginx front end things, some Elasticsearch. And all of these things are working together on the Weave network, but it's kind of hard to see. So what I'm going to do is run uh, another Weaveworks tool called Scope. It's going to draw us a picture of what's going on. So it'll be easier for you to follow what is happening here. So here I am. Uh, so this is um, running locally here. And you can see the picture of the application. So uh, what I'm going to do is switch to, these are all the containers. I'm going to switch to a different mode. I'm going to just look by DNS host name. So what I'm doing here is uh, collapsing down all the containers that have the same DNS host name. So I can see I've got my client. There's one container there. I've got two front end clients. I've got an app server made out of two containers. And so this entire application, all these um, containers talk to each other just by using DNS resolution. So the client, when it wants to send requests to the server, just does a DNS lookup for frontend.weave.local, and the micro DNS server inside of Weave comes back and gives it the IP addresses, round robin IP addresses, for the two containers that implement the front end. So it's super simple. Uh, everyone knows how to do a DNS lookup. Um, doesn't matter what language you write your application in, you know, your container is running in every uh, application. You don't need a special library, every application can do a DNS lookup. So I can see that I've got my container here. It's, it's got all of these other different components in there. And then in this diagram, all these lines represent communications actually between the various different containers. So we're seeing the sort of the live map of uh, what's going on uh, with this particular application. So you can see that very, very easily, we deployed our application. Uh, and it was very simple for all the components to find each other and send requests. Um, we didn't have to do port mapping. We didn't have to set up console, we can just get going very quickly. And you can set this up faster. You can run these containers faster than you can deploy the instances on AWS ECS. But let's, we can do that too. So uh, earlier on, I uh, went onto ECS and I launched exactly the same thing. I did it through a CloudFormation template instead. 
So you can see uh, this is uh, available on GitHub if you want to take a look later on. But you can see in here all of my definitions uh, to run my various different containers inside of ECS. And so I ran this on two Docker hosts, and, and, or two instances, I should say, on ECS. And uh, one of them here, we can do the same trick. And we can see our, how our application ran on ECS. So in this, there's a one slight difference here. We've got two clients on the front end instead of one client. That's the only difference in this application. And again, we can see that from the diagram that we drew here. So what happens is I ran this application. It was completely unchanged. Right? There was no change in the code. I ran exactly the same containers that I ran on my laptop. And I just ran them on AWS ECS with a CloudFormation template. And they can all talk to each other. They can all do service discovery. Uh, and everybody can find everyone else. And so that makes it much, much easier for you to uh, deploy your containers on ECS and do service discovery. You can also build a network that spans your laptop, your data center, and AWS. So you can run containers in different places, and the network can span all of those. Same thing still works. Do the DNS lookup, find the IP address of the other containers, and run everything simply. So. This is one way that you can um, improve uh, your, your speed for uh, deploying microservices on, uh, on ECS. So what's happening inside of uh, ECS is when you're starting this instance now, you're running this Weave Router container, uh, and it runs on each host, each instance. And so the uh, Weave Router allocates IP addresses to containers. So it uh, does that by dividing up the IP address space into segments. So each router that starts owns a different segment of the IP address space. So the routers uh, coordinate with each other and to divide and conquer on the IP address space. So those address ranges are non-overlapping. What that means is that the Weave router local to a particular instance can hand out IP addresses to containers that start on that same instance, and they're guaranteed not to be duplicates of any other IP addresses running anywhere else. And so eventually what you get is this eventually consistent uh, network uh, topology, and then the routers um, exchange updates, the uh, gossip updates to other Weave routers, and that's how they build up this view of the topology. So the router also maintains that IP address to DNS name mapping, and as, I, as containers start on other hosts, and the Weave router hands out the IP addresses, you know the updates come over in a gossip update. And so over time, all of the routers learn about all the containers, their IP addresses, and their names. It's a very simple DNS server. It just responds to that local domain. Anything that it doesn't recognize as being part of the local domain, it just passes on to the regular name resolver. Same uh, method of connectivity between hosts, VXLAN. So this rides on top of your VPC inside of uh, AWS. right? And so all containers on this local bridge, and they're all connected to this VXLAN. Uh, so it just rides on top of the existing network that you have. When you deploy onto ECS, uh, if you put all of your instances into an auto-scaling group, then the Weave routers uh, realize they're inside of an auto-scaling group, and they can use that API to learn about each other. So you don't have to tell uh, the zero configuration here. You don't need to tell one Weave router about the other Weave routers uh, because they can learn that information directly from the auto-scaling group. We also use, uh, we've got a, a beta of a uh, cloud service version of the thing that I just ran on my laptop for uh, scope there. Uh, and so this runs uh, on uh, AWS today. Um, and uh, we're using uh, Kubernetes for the uh, scheduler for that. But it gives you an idea of you know, how we can use this technology, build microservices, uh, and make things uh, run faster and easier on ECS.